Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And Alex, we are all alone today. How did that happen? Uh, we kicked everybody out. Well, that too. Uh, actually, we have uh, uh, an interview that we are recording later in the week, but uh, this week we are uh, by ourselves, and that's fine because I actually wanted to tell you about something monumental that happened. Can you, you built a monument to yourself in the basement. I did. I built an effigy out of uh, sticks, twigs, and branches. And now it, we can burn it. Uh, yeah, I suppose you could. Um, but it looks so much like me that I think I would take offense by it. No, that's not what happened, by the way. <laughs> I did not build that, folks. No, uh, I played D&D 5e for the first time. Gasp. Gasps all around. Yes, yes, I did. That was a, a whole lot of fun. Uh, and, and I needed to tell you how well it went. Tell me all about it, Nathan. I am so curious about what happened your first time playing D&D 5e. Also, your second time playing D&D in general. In general, yes. It, I, I can never tell if you're being sarcastic or not, but I'm going to assume you're genuine, <laughs> so I'm going to move forward. I am um, genuinely sarcastic. Okay, that makes sense, too. Like, uh, middle of the month... Uh, in uh, in July, uh, I was uh, I did a one shot. It was called the Malmet Heist. It's actually a uh, module from Cobalt Press, uh, and I did that over on Steel Empire. And uh, we did we did it over two weeks. We we did two different sessions. It took two weeks. Oh, two <laughs> sessions. It not, took, not fourteen days. No, it did not take fourteen whole days to do it. I'll I'll explain kind of like how the heist is laid out though. the The way they do this is. They set it up so that there's there's four days until the actual heist. So like for when when you start, it's four days out. Okay. And eventually, on the fourth day, there's this big viper tournament at a casino, and they take in a lot of money. And the idea is that you're supposed to steal the money uh, after the end of the tournament. David Steele, who was running the game, kind of figured that it might take like an hour and change or something like that. And, you know, there'd be discussion in between. So figuring like maybe an hour and a half or so for each day. Uh, so if you did that over four days, it would be like a, a six hour long session. So they, they were planning on breaking it up. And actually, it ended up taking us longer than that. We probably went seven altogether. Oh boy. Uh, and, and Nathan, and you talked too much, didn't you? I did talk too much. That happens to me a lot. I feel like we could have probably gone longer, but David realized that time was pretty short. So uh he kind of truncated the end just to kind of get us to the end. I I think. We were we were all in for continuing to try and work out this this crazy ass heist thing. Sure. So when you say Viper tournament, do you mean like snakes? No, no, no. That's just what they call it. The, there were no snakes that were actually playing in the casino. That might be a so, letdown for you. So, so what are the Vipers? Why is it called a Viper tournament? Because uh, uh, why is anything named after a dangerous animal? Because it sounds cool, you know? So like ostrich racing? Like ostrich racing or, you know, or uh, a Dodge Viper, you know? Uh, the car is want... not an actual snake. I do want a tournament with those. Oh, yeah, uh, obviously. You know what you do? You watch the Fast and Furious movies. Oh, okay. They're all in there. <laughs> you can just you just watch those. Those all have very cool-sounding names. So those, uh, so there were no actual Vipers involved. Uh, there were players, high-stakes uh, game players and everything. And uh, there was a specific game that they play at the casino, and uh, I think that had something to do with it, too. We didn't get too deep into the weeds on that, uh, because we were too busy trying to figure out how to rob... Everybody? Yeah, specifically... So it's like the York New City auction on Hunter x Hunter, when you just rob the entire auction. Got it. Yeah, exactly. And it was mostly just revolving around the fact that somebody gave us this uh, quest who uh, didn't like the owner of this big casino and thought that he was like a really terrible person and he was kind of like a paranoid guy and uh, was a terrible boss. And so people wanted to kind of see him get his comeuppance. And to do that, we, we were going to rob the whole thing. Anyway, that, that was the setup. We had six players 
and I was one of those players. Good. I, I assumed you would have been one of them because you said you were playing. You are correct. Your powers of deduction are wonderful. <laughs> we had pre-made characters uh, because we were working for a group called The Golden Song who does this kind of stuff. Uh, but each of those characters had a different role. So what do you imagine I picked? I, I think you had mentioned you were playing a bard. I did mention I was playing a bard. So, you know, that kind of spoils that. But anyway, it, did you imagine I would play a bard? I imagine that you probably said you were going to play a bard thinking bards were easy. I actually chose a bard realizing I wanted to be a bullshit artist. And I figured that's the best class for that. I mean, bard or rogue or sorcerer. Right. I just figured I wanted to be able to talk my way out of a paper bag if I needed to. A and bard or yeah. a rogue or a sorcerer. <laughs> Why a sorcerer? Sorcerers are charisma-based. Really? Oh. Also, I guess a warlock would work for that, too. Oh. Um, okay. Yeah. They're both charisma-based classes, so they'll have a high charisma regardless of their skills. Mm-hmm. Um, which means you're better at doing it well, i thought and uh okay because usually when i think of that i think that they're usually more of a spell casting like they're they're more interesting in you know casting spells and shooting things with fireballs and such sure okay but they're <laughs> but they're also talky talky if you play them that way sure oh okay and, and now the rogue you said rogue but now i always like rogues are th rogues are thieves of opportunity Okay. Or just thieves right out. So they can also kind of be a grifter. If you play a charisma-based rogue, like if you don't go damage rogue right. and you want to be a sly, smooth, silver-tongued bastard, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, I don't think I had those options. <laughs> so <laughs> No, you had a pre-gen character. You played what, what you right, got. Right, exactly. And my bard was actually built so that uh, it actually had really great uh, advantages to deception and uh, persuasion. So oh it, was, uh, it was good for that. I was playing at level five, so I was a little bit nervous about that, too, because, again... Because you had no idea how to build up from level one to level five? I didn't know the difference between level one and level five. There's a, there's a lot of difference between level one and level five. Okay. There's several features worth of differences. Okay. Especially for a bard, mm. where you get a ton of stuff. Bards have a ton of abilities. Mm. Yes. I only had a handful. When the people go, oh, bards, they play music, they must be easy. And it's really like, no, that is not just what they do. Sorry, honey. They are not easy. No. They are really complex. I mean, it's kind of nice that you have all of the tools in, in your box that you can play with, but uh, I can understand why it would be very daunting for someone coming into a game yeah. fresh. Yeah. Um, and just imagine if you got in there and it was a level 10 bard. What if I were a level 50 bard? Uh, they don't go past level 20 in 5e. They should. I want a level 50 bard. I won't know what to do with it, but I know that I'll be pretty stocky. I'll be able to take on a dragon by arm wrestling it at level 50. Anyways. Now, see, the interesting thing, though, I found was that since I knew that the system was kind of foreign to me, uh, I tried to just look at some of my spells and stuff that I had, uh, sort of like just in downtime where other characters were on their own little adventures. Uh, because one thing that we ended up doing was, uh, you know, at the beginning of the day, we kind of figured out where everybody was going in this town. And then we kind of broke off into smaller groups uh, to try and cover more in a day. Because splitting the party is the best idea. I, I, my character even mentions that in the episode, if you watch it, we, we split up on the first day, and Adesu, who's the character I'm playing, is kind of going, you know, I, I really have to tell you, uh, I, the split in the party thing, great idea, great idea. Uh, but, you know, I was just thinking, but, you know, we needed to cover ground, and we weren't going to be getting into combat right away. Like, we, w right now, we're just scouting. Right. Unless you want to get into combat. I mean, I suppose you could always get into combat if you really wanted to. Um, if you want to, yeah. I mean, we had a... Just uh, throw something at a guard. We had, we had a fighter who was a kobold, and, uh, and she uh, tried to, you know, get in the good graces of 
the uh like the mercenary group that was in town and uh there was a point where she wanted to get in so they were going to uh, test her by you know uh combat trial by fire yeah exactly like okay uh you know take on our member over here and uh you know if you win maybe we'll consider uh, uh hiring you and uh so that could have gone into combat but what happened instead is before combat started um, she decided to just try and punch him in the face as hard as she could, <laughs> and, uh, and she, she rolled real good, and so, uh, so, so we kind of role-played that out instead. Oh, okay. And, and he reels back and goes, oh, my nose, you broke my nose! And, uh, they kind of go, you're in. <laughs> that, that was very good. All right, then. But, you know, I, uh, I had a lot of fun. Uh, I got to sit at a casino, and I got to do uh, a whole bunch of other crazy voices because, you know, I figured that he had a basic voice, and then he was going to use other voices to try and, you know, keep suspicion off of him. So, uh, so I had, like, this exaggerated French accent when I went into the uh, casino. Uh, which was fun. Did you change how you looked at all to do these different voices, or were you just walking around town, same guy wearing the same outfit, same look, just doing weird accents everywhere? Oh no, I had a disguise kit with me, oh, so boy. I made sure. I made sure to. I I was considering walking in looking like a clown, and I decided I mean, against you, that. You already did that just by walking in. That is true. I decided that I would just look like I am well to do instead. Uh, and that seemed to be a, probably a better approach. I was going in with the leader of the Golden Song, and she was supposed to be in, like, evening wear, so I was like, maybe I shouldn't walk in, uh, you know, with... with looking the, like the, the court jester. Looking like the court jester, or, like, literally, I was thinking maybe just, like, the red nose and, like, the, the rainbow wig, and just go in like that. Because I'm a performance artist. What, what kind of demon is this? <laughs> it's a clown demon. You'll fly too. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't do that. Um, but hey, you know what? I did. Uh, you know, uh, ingratiate myself up onto stage and did a round of Bohemian Rhapsody for everybody. Oh, great! Yeah, uh, I thought that that was really good. You know, I had this whole nice persona. How, how did your performance go? Uh, you know what? I think everybody in the casino enjoyed it fully. It also distracted a lot of people so that some of the other members of my uh, group could kind of do recon without being noticed and sidle up to some of the guards and see if they could get keys and such. I was basically the giant distraction for the entire uh, one shot. Nathan, if you had a label on your head in life, it would just be giant distraction. It would be? Oh. It would be. What did you have to use for mechanics? Okay, up to uh, some of these points, like okay. it's the first time playing Five E, so right. I want to know like the mechanics that you got to actually experience. I want to know how you liked them. The uh, the thing was that I was really wary about getting too far into the mechanics because again, I was really like we used Roll Twenty, so like my character sheet was already built so i knew everything that i had on me and all my equipment and stuff i figured that since i was a bard i probably wanted to avoid combat because it's not a strength uh and i wanted to try and and see if i could find non combat solutions sure i mean bards aren't terrible at combat they're just not like a fighter everyone in dnd right. is able to do combat to varying degrees right Right. Uh, so one thing that I used a lot throughout the course, I, I, th I guess the thing I did the most was, since I did have a lot of social skills, was to use persuasion to my benefit, to try and, uh, to try and coax different characters uh, to do things that they would not normally do. So you made the bad guys commit suicide. Uh, man, that would have been a good idea. You can't, you can't generally, even with like a dominate person spell. You generally can't make someone kill themselves. This this is not you casting mind control as a priest in World of Warcraft on another player, and then making them jump off of the uh, middle of bl uh, Black Fathom Depths into the lava, which is really fun. You must have gotten a kick out of that. Yes. No, I did not do that. Instead, I was kind of like uh, wheeling and dealing behind the scenes and trying to set things up. There was a group of urchins 
that uh, one of our youngest members, uh, you know, was familiar with. And so he introduced me to them. I convinced them to be uh, performance artists and I gave them a bunch of uh, firecrackers and uh, basically told them to run around the casino and yell and scream and, and put the firecrackers down on the floor when I yelled Leroy Jenkins. Did you really yell Leroy Jenkins? I did yell. That was the code I gave them was Leroy Jenkins, the That's great hero. So meta. <laughs> <laughs> and and it worked so well <laughs> because it just creates utter chaos on the floor. So I was doing a lot of story element stuff because I knew that that's something that regardless of the mechanical system that you're using, uh, your story elements you can play around with typically uh, regardless. And so so that was something I could wrap my head around. Now toward the end... When we eventually got to the point where, uh, you know, it was time to rob from the vault. Stealing all the things. Stealing all the things. You know, we had, um, it was a thousand pounds of gold is what it was supposed to be. That's a, that's a, how do you carry a thousand pounds worth of gold? You need like a horse. You know, the thing about it is, is luckily we had a couple pretty, you know, stout characters on our team uh and we had gotten a couple people to help us out but also they had bags of holding of course they did the bags of holding you are helpful that one just use like teleport or like oh there was a... your pocket dimensions or dwarves just use dwarves there was um oh uh, one one of our characters was a druid he was a were lion so i think he he was able to carry quite a bit but our main i'm sorry did you just say your druid was a were lion or were they uh they could turn into a lion they could turn into a lion. That's a thing, right? Yeah. Um. It, there's a difference between a were animal and a druid shape shifting, though. Uh, is there? Yes. I thought that it was a were lion. One is like Hanterpy, and they get an animal form and a hybrid form, which is you know mm. your bipedal animal, mm -hmm. and the other is just a pure animal. So Lycanthrope gets oh. those two. Oh. But okay. a druid can shape shift into animals. I think he was a were lion and a druid. He might have been a druid too. So, but maybe now, okay. uh, now that I'm thinking, maybe he wasn't a druid. Maybe he was just a were lion that was like druid sympathetic. I mean, you would still need a class. Yeah, but I don't remember what it was. I, for some reason, I thought that if you're a were lion, you probably were a druid. My my character is a were tiger and a druid. And he's a shapeshifter see, druid. See, so, you I mean, have clouded my ideas of what characters are supposed to do by telling me. You had a druid that could transform into an animal that had a carrying capacity that was pretty good. Yeah. Because they were strong. Yeah. Probably a horse. Probably. <laughs> I remember the mage, what the mage ended up doing was there was um, a spell, and I can't remember what it was called, but... Um, you could basically put things into, like, a pocket dimension, and as long as you kept the pocket dimension open, um, you were fine, but if the spell ended, everything inside of that pocket dimension gets destroyed. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, kind of. Okay. It's a, it was so, an item or a so, spell? It was a spell. So we had a few different ways to try and get around that, but we were hindered by a few different things. One, that group of mercenaries who, you know, were hired to be extra protection for the uh for the casino yes and then also they they had clockwork hounds and they had a giant mechanical spider okay near the vault so they, they had a lot of a lot of gadgetry they had um they had a whole system of how they get money from like a counting room down to the vault and there was a a pad like a, a keypad that uh, if you got it wrong it would shoot like poison darts at you and stuff there was a lot of stuff going on now, when I originally thought of that, I did have one really wacky idea. Okay, did you do it? Uh, no. Uh, actually, David kind of put the kibosh on it because he said, it's a really great idea, but I will tell you that it, like right now, I'll just tell you, it's not going to work. I, I had this idea that, well, if it's so difficult to get into the vault, then maybe instead of trying to out, think the system uh convince the paranoid casino owner that his system is completely compromisable 
and we know how to compromise it and like we're 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 a security consultant firm and we've already figured out how to get around all of it but we can fix it for you which would like just kind of like override the whole thing and just let us in to uh to kind of get around a lot of those systems like just convince them that like the clockwork hounds are malfunctioning you know get uh, make illusions and stuff just to make it look like they're sparking like we already know about the spider the the keypad easy like we already have one of we actually uh had one of the guards keys so something i can show them like see we were able to get a key off one of your guards already and uh one of them was coerced already so we knew that uh, somebody had taken like Mokta down to the vault so we already knew the whole layout so i figured like if you could just make him paranoid enough that he actually understood that his system was rigged or flawed that he would have to change his entire game plan like the day before and in that chaos it made it much easier to actually steal from the vault you would think so the problem, of course, was that since he already had that contract with the mercenaries, uh, and that was good for another, like, two, five years or something like that, um, he was Since not when the mercenaries go under five-year contract? Really good mercenaries, or ones that are really lacking for work. Apparently. Uh, apparently. So as, as much fun as I thought it would be to just kind of, like, do the complete opposite thing and uh, and try to sneak around that system bypass it all just by uh like going with what i thought was the weak link of the actual owner being paranoid about everything uh that wasn't really going to work i also had machinations that while i was there if i could find the documentation that proved that he owned the casino i already have forgery skills so maybe i could forge a new uh contract and also uh steal the casino out from under him uh, which, you which just would, wanted to super metal the entire module. Got it. Uh yes, exactly. I wanted to. I wanted to screw the whole thing up. Which I have to say, David was probably also a little reluctant to do because he's going to be uh, doing this at Gen Con. He's going to be running this module, so he wanted to kind of get a feel for it and some of the ways that it could be played out. So I think that that would have yeah. pretty much just broken the module altogether. How can some of these be played out? Let's throw Nathan in. <laughs> yeah, let, let's see if Nathan can break this game. And I, I almost did. Um, but anyway, when it got down to the actual heist, you know, we, we had a guard that was working with us. And the rest of my team was able to kind of get down into the vault and start working their magic. Uh, and they had found some, some creative ways to get around the system. I was still up in the ballroom. Uh, doing another rend I was doing like Cher's greatest hits or something like that. Uh, I was I had uh, gotten some uh, mortar uh, fireworks outside, so I was leading them all out for a wonderful fireworks display. I was regaling the wedding party. This there was a wedding party that was there at the same time, regaling them with some wonderful tales and everything like that. Basically, just trying to keep everybody distracted and all the guards and the owner on the floor. And then, of course, I used the Leroy Jenkins tactic when he was going to head on down to the vault to uh, cause even more utter chaos in the show floor. Despite their best efforts, they did trip a silent alarm, and, uh, and they ended up with guards on them pretty quick. And the mechanical spider, and there were some dogs... And, uh, and dogs and spiders and oh my yeah um, basically everything you know what really would have caused a distraction mm? murdering one of the married couples <laughs> i think that that might have put more heat on me than i really wanted at the time yeah but you know it causes chaos it's... and everybody in the like accidentally shoot him with a firework but like, it's, it's I, the daughter of the you, mayor it's even more chaos then okay. because everybody's in the yard trying to deal with this one thing I was, I was Pete's on you, and everyone in the vault would have been fine. I was, I was really trying to to avoid any kind of lethal contact with people because I figured that that's just going to draw more attention to you than you really need at Nathan, the end to to get Nathan, out. Yes, you do sleight. Of, you do a bard with sleight of hand. I assume you had sleight of hand. I think so. Yes. So you sleight a handy, you make it look like an accident, like you accidentally shot this girl with a firework. Oh. You know, accidentally light a building or two on fire because the fireworks went crazy. Right. Air quotes on crazy. Right. 
huge distraction part of town's on fire someone just got shot with a firework you don't know what's going on you're freaking out because all this shouldn't be happening uh, see i kind of figure that like when you've set half the town on fire you've probably just run out of ideas that feels like very limited thinking at the end no it's very just, good thinking because it's a huge distraction let's just set half the town on fire and kill half the people we'll be able to get away from the uh, this is why people always become like arsons and murder hobos in games <laughs> it seems like i'm really... trying to pull off a giant heist you don't think that a little collateral damage to the town is okay well you you've probably seen a few heist movies in your time, right? Yeah, once or, once or twice. Aren't you always so much more satisfied when the heist is not like cars rolling over and buildings shattering, but it's literally like they use like sneaky times to to trick people out of their uh out out like the Ocean's Eleven kind of model of You know what like, I used to trick people? How? A car running into them. Well, <laughs> Worked for that bear. It um, did work for the bear. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, see, didn't see it coming. It didn't. I didn't see it coming either. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was not your plan, though. <laughs> it was you, not my plan. That bear had just stolen all your money and you were trying to get it back. <laughs> Maybe that's what happened. Anyway, they wound up in combat. And, and so I had to do initiative, too, because we were in initiative at that point. But I was still up in the ballroom. So what I tried to do for a spell was charm person on the owner. Ah, well, charm person's great when they're in a heightened sense of stuff going on, important things. Probably a bit harder to get off. Right. I did not succeed at charm person, so that was like the one thing I was able to do in combat. Luckily, they were able to uh, basically kill all the guards and and blow up the spider and and make it up to to the uh, the top of the casino. So so hold on, hold on. Yes. So me suggesting that you accidentally lit a building or two on fire and possibly light a what the groom or the bride on fire with a right. firework or like seriously right. injure someone right is too big of a distraction. But right. killing the guards and the mercenaries and the spider and well, exploding things down there is not. Well, I was trying to avoid that as best I could. Well, I'm like, sure they were too, but collateral damage on a couple buildings versus a bunch of people dead. I mean, well, you weigh your options. You know, in retrospect, probably, but I, th I was really hoping that we would be able to get in and get out in a more sneaky fashion. You like, know. without anybody getting an arrow through the eye or whatever happened out yeah, there. Yeah, no, if you want to do that, you need an entire party of rogues. Oh, I get you. Because, you know, half your party is not sneaky. If well, you have a fighter and a druid and a sorcerer and a warlock and all this stuff. Right, right, fair I don't, I don't know what all, the, all they were. But if you've got, a, like, a party of all stealths, I mean, the druid, if you have a druid, oh, man, they are your stealth masters. Because they can become a shadow wolf. No, uh, no, oh. they can't, actually. Oh. Sorry. Uh, because they could become, like, a spider. Oh. Or a bat, or a cat, or a pigeon, or a mouse, or any inconspicuous creature they want. I, on many occasions, have become a tiny spider and crawled around places that I want to scout. Right. Because, you know what, you don't think... You don't think that spider on the wall is actually looking at you and observing you. Kind of like that whole fly on the wall, but it's the spider on the wall, so it, it catches the fly that's on the wall, eats it, and then yeah. also gets I mean, the perception Yeah, I mean, you can be it. the fly on the wall later when you actually get the ability to change into things that can fly. But yeah, but if you could change into things that fly, the, an actual fly is not the thing that you'd want to be. You could be like a condor. No, a dragon is the thing you want to be, obviously. But dragons are not inconspicuous. You 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 sit on a wall as a dragon, and everybody is gonna know it. I I mean, yeah, it's basically the D and D equivalent of the elephant in the room, right? Yeah, there's a dragon. There's in the a room. dragon in the room, just hanging and it's out, eating. It's eating the guards. Well, I can tell you that there were no dragons uh, in this particular scenario. <laughs> what I was trying to do at for the most part, while they were in combat, was uh, they had called in reinforcements once the alarm tripped, and I knew that they would be coming through the main floor of the casino, 
So I was just trying to figure out if there was a way that I could head them off so uh, they had time to escape before, like, the rest of the mercenaries came in. Now, luckily, they didn't really arrive beforehand, and um, where it kind of could have been uh, more role-playing to go forward, but we were running out of time, one of our characters uh, had uh, done a disguise self spell. Uh, Great spell. It is. To look like the owner of the casino. And so he was still in that form when we got upstairs. And so the narrative part of this that, that David did was basically say, uh, Naughty sees you still uh, looking exactly like him and is so freaked out by it, he has a heart attack and dies. And then you get, you get out through the back of the casino to the cart that you had set up and uh and and get the money in the cart and you 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 succeed well then you've solved the heist puzzle <laughs> and we did kind of sit there kind of going i don't think that would have worked in real life but we'll take the win of course in real life you wouldn't have magic spells and giant mechanical spiders so why wouldn't you have giant mechanical spiders nathan well, I mean, they did in Wild Wild West, right? So, I mean, Elon Musk is making a cybernetic dragon. In his lifelong quest to make an actual real-life Dungeons & Dragons campaign. <laughs> so why wouldn't you have mechanical spiders? You know, I guess at this point you will, but it feels like when you make a giant mechanical spider, you might as well just start twirling your your villain mustache around <laughs> at that point. <laughs> just like uh, Kenneth Branagh in Wild Wild West. Never forget. I always think of those things as being better for, like, a steampunk setting, but I guess that they do exist in, like, the Dungeons & Dragons. So, anyway, we did, we did succeed at said heist in the most roundabout way possible. In the most ludicrous way possible. In the most ludicrous way possible, and with, uh, with very little foresight. But, you know what? It was, uh, it was still a whole lot of fun. And we got to we got to kind of play around with the creative options that we had, and um, we had a, a couple people who were more uh, veteran players, uh, but a lot of us were very new. So, so at this point, aside from just hearing about what you guys did, I want to know like what you thought of Five E and your D and D experience. Yes, what I was really happy about was that the mechanics did not feel, at least the way we were playing, the mechanics did not feel so overbearing that I could not engage with it. I, I did not feel... I, I can imagine that there are games uh, or, or uh, DMs or, uh, you know, play styles where the mechan it's much more mechanics heavy. We had a lot more storytelling that was involved, so I didn't feel like the mechanics were weighing me down. But that being said, when I actually started to kind of look at some of the things that I had available to me and kind of started to think how I could use them creatively, things seemed to be pretty well laid out. Like, it, it seemed to be pretty straightforward so that if I did need to utilize them, because I was thinking of some ways that I could utilize them, I felt pretty confident I knew what to do if if I needed to uh, throw some of those things out. Okay. It did not particularly feel like I'm sure if I got a little bit more into the mechanical aspect of it, um, it might have felt maybe a little more confusing. But one, it was helpful that it was a pre-gen character, so I didn't have to build my character from scratch. It was a pre-gen scenario, so we already knew what our goal was. So a lot of things were laid out at the start, and, and I already knew what all of my stuff was because it was laid out in front of me. So one thing that they do in Roll20, which is nice, is if you have your character sheet, um, there are ways where you can just get all of the information on each one of your spells instantaneously right there on the screen. So I was able to look through and kind of get an idea of how I could use those spells, what my distance was for them, what they actually do. Um, and I could see how I could use them in a creative way. Again, being a bard and having the skills that I had, uh, which was kind of like just some, some kind of like illusions, charm spells, distraction kind of tactics. I could see how I could use those in really creative ways. Um, I did not want to get into combat. I think I had like a dagger, so I was probably not going to be very well well suited for that. I always feel like combat is the most mechanics heavy part, though. 
generally, I mean, spells actually would probably be the most mechanically heavy part. Like, melee or ranged combat is, is pretty much, you know, clear-cut. But spells have so many different effects. Mm-hmm. So. Um, what did you think you had the hardest time with, with the system? Oh, boy. What did I have the like, hardest time with? Like, not the module, not the role-playing, but with the system. I, I think that the hardest thing I found was there are definitely some parts of the system that it feels like have been in Dungeons and Dragons for a really long time. And if you're not particularly familiar with the system, they kind of assume that you know what's going on. Like, for instance, the best thing I can say is like I had my charm person spell and yes. I said I said I was going to cast it. And so like I go to cast it. And they were like, well, you don't actually have to do that. It's, it's to a saving throw. So the other character has to do the saving throw. And I was like, oh, okay. I thought it was like a challenge or something. Like, do I have to roll? No, you're, you have to roll to save against the thing I'm doing. Okay, so it's like a counter roll. All right, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, it's an opposed roll. It's an opposed roll. It's an opposed um, roll. So, or right. an opposed check. Yeah, it's a, a check, yeah. So you, like, in that case, you'll cast a spell on your target. Um, right. And they just need to see if it affects them or not. Right. It's different than an attack roll, which you have to roll to see if you hit them and hurt them. Right, right. So, like, if it's a check system, I know that I cast the spell and it should hit, but they have to determine whether they save against it. I was I was a little bit confused by some of those more nuanced aspects of it, and I feel like they've just been in the system for so long that people just kind of don't think about it. But if you're new to the system, I think sometimes when it gets into, you know, your, your saving throws or, like, all of the different uh, levels of bonuses that I received, I didn't really even know how to calculate a lot of that out. Like, I knew that I had, like, a plus 10 to deception or something like that, but I also knew that I had plus 1 to any other stats. But then I started to think, well, does that mean I actually have plus 11 to deception? If you didn't make the character sheet, I, I can see how that would be harder for you. Right, right. Because you're like, alright, did I count this bonus? For you, the plus 1 to all your skills is from Jack of All Trades. Which a, which a bard gets. Okay, yes, yes, I did have I believe that. that's what it's called. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if your character sheet included that bonus in all the skill checks. Right. But the way you would check that is you look at your skill. Mm hmm So say it's deception, which would be a charisma-based skill. So you'd look at the skill, you'd look at your proficiency bonus you get, if you're proficient in it, which I assume you were. Mm. So at your level, you'd look at the sheet and you go proficiency bonus of like three or four. Then you'd look at your skill. And see what it says. If it's checked off, you get your proficiency. If not, you get your skill. Uh, you get your, your attribute, so your charisma bonus. So you, being proficient, you would get your charisma bonus. Which, what was your charisma? Oh, it was high. Oh, like I'd 18? Have to look. Yeah, I, it was like my highest stat. So. so you'd probably get like a plus four from that. And either a, like a plus three with the other one. With your proficiency. Uh, proficiency bonus probably like a plus three or two mm. and then you get like a, a plus one from jack of all trades um right so you can figure it out that way okay if you're familiar with the system but where again you didn't make the sheet so you don't know if they factored in your jack of all trades into your skill i'm just looking at my pre-gen i pulled it up here uh yeah i had an 18 to my charisma uh so i had a plus four for my bonus um and then i had a jack of all trades, and that adds. It says one to all other skills. So whatever I don't have for my my regular skills, I guess. So all other non proficient skills. All all other skill checks. That's poorly worded. Yeah, it really is. Why, why does it say other? All other skill check. Like it says what your skill bonuses are, and then at the end it says jack of all trades, which says you add plus one to all other skill checks on my sheet. I mean, if it has a list of skills that you get specific bonuses yeah. to, yeah, yeah, that's what. Then it has. you get those, and then all the other skills that are not those ones, you would get the plus one, right? If that's what it is, right? I, I think that's what it is. Yeah, I'm not looking at it, so I don't know. Right, right. Anyone listening um, who's played a bard, it's fine. Yeah, it's good. And uh, and and there were some other things. Like it also told me that I have a, a disguise kit and a forgery kit, and I kind of got like the idea behind it, but I couldn't really figure out exactly what i could do with those 
I get that I could discuss. So they're tools. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe what they do is give you a a bonus to using those things. Although you don't have specific skills, for instance, right for forgery. That's not a skill that is on your character sheet. But it means if you're trying to forge, you would get a bonus to doing so. Uh, and it's funny because, like, even now, like, I'll look at what they give me for equipment and I realize I didn't have to do, like, m- most of this <laughs> or even think about it because it says that I have, like, a pair of weighted dice. Man, I could have used those. I yeah, could have <laughs> cheated at some games. Set of marked cards. That would have been great. Yep, could have cheated at some games. Maps and scrolls, bottle of ink, ink pen. Okay, so, I mean, I guess I could have used, like, if you have a forgery kit, I guess an ink pen, bottle of ink, those things make sense. If you have a forgery kit, you need a document to forge from. You need to be able to examine someone else's writing. Right. Right. So Otherwise, you're just using your own writing. I did not have to use Bardic Inspiration. I, Bardic Inspiration is actually really great. It seems like it. The only thing that I did take away from that is I ordered a drink at the bar and I called it Bardic Inspiration. In my head canon, I know what a bardic inspiration is, and it's basically you take the strongest alcohol that you can find, pour it into a glass, and set it on fire. That's All a bardic right, inspiration. I, I decided to name a drink that, because I thought it sounds so perfect <laughs> for, for an alcoholic beverage. Just meta up the whole game. Oh, I certainly did. Believe it. Well, you know, I, you do have to realize, like, I was playing a charlatan. Like, that was part uh, of my thing. And I that's all... That's your background, yes. Yes. And I had a false identity, too. Just one? Uh, one for this particular thing, yeah. Sure. Okay, I had a character that had, like, seven. Well, that's, that's nice. But you were probably building that from scratch, right? No, that was for a one-shot. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, he had, like, seven because he was an assassin and a, a shadow monk and... Uh, an infiltrator, like a spy kind of person. Mm-hmm. So instead of just, you know, killing everybody and assassinating people, he didn't like to do violence too much. He, he would knock people out instead. Yeah. Um, but he had, like, several different personas in the city right? that he went by so that no one actually knew who he was. I see. And I'm realizing, like, some other things that I just kind of thought were background, but I'm realizing that there were mechanical parts to it. Um, one of my feats was actor. And so I was kind of like, oh, cool, yeah, I act. That's a thing I do. But it also gives you advantage on impersonate other or and mimicking voices. I didn't have to particularly mimic anyone's voices because I made up voices all my own. I, I did do several different kinds of voices to try and throw people off my scent. I did one for the uh, that sounded more like a Russian accent that I did for the guy that ran like the trading emporium. Uh, because I didn't want him to know who I was either. I I had this whole thing where I just kept going in so that I could get the s- supplies, and I just kept telling him to put it on my tab, and he didn't really understand what that meant. But I d- I had no intention of actually paying him money for anything. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday <laughs> for a cheeseburger <laughs> oh, today. Okay, wimpy. The other thing I can say that I was really digging one. I can understand, like, especially with the way that it was set up where you're sleeping every night and coming back, um, the whole idea of spell levels didn't really bother me too much because I was like, I'll have plenty, you know, but I can kind of see where it would start to get a little bit tense when you only have like X number of slots per level of spell and you don't know how long you really have before you'll be able to rest and regain those slots. Like, like if you have four days and you know that there's a day night cycle and there's X number of things you do in that day and then you're, you're resting after that. Yeah. Especially when you get into combat, yeah. multiple combats mm-hmm. and you burn all your spells yep. and suddenly it's like, can we just take a long rest? And you're like, it's the middle of the day. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but you see that with parties and dungeon crawls and stuff and that, that there's an issue inherent in that. Mm hmm. I mean, 5e is not as bad because short rests do replenish a bunch of things for a bunch of classes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, sorcerers can get some of their spells back during short rest. Uh, warlocks get their very limited spell slots back on a short rest because they're not spell-driven. Yeah. Druids get their shape changes back on short rest. All sorts of these things can happen on a short rest, which is like 30 minutes or longer. Right. Right. Um, 
But like wizards and them don't get all of their spells back. Yeah. Until a long rest. Okay. So it means you have to have eight uninterrupted hours of sleep, or as an elf, four uninterrupted hours of sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but that that's an inherent thing where if you're like in a dungeon crawl and you're going from room to room to room and there's constant encounters, it's like two rooms in, you burn all your spells. Right. What do you do? Yep. Yep. It's, well, we need to sleep for eight hours and come back. Yeah. Yeah. And you can sleep in the dungeon. It's like, all right, we've been here literally 20 minutes. Yeah. How did you burn through all your spells? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it feels very unnatural to say, okay, everybody, let's roll out the bedroll. <laughs> sleep here in the middle of the dungeon. <laughs> so we can regain it's, I, it's definitely happened to me more than once. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? That's why I really like cantrips. I, I look cantrips are really good in 5e because they're unlimited. Yeah. You can just do them as many times as you want. And so And to be honest with you, yeah. Warlock has one of the most badass cantrips. Really? I think in the game. What what can he do? Eldritch Blast. Yeah. Eldritch Blast. Ooh. Nathan. That sounds Anyone good. who's listening and who has played 5e and encountered a warlock knows that Eldritch Blast is disgusting. <laughs> it's a 120 foot range uh spell attack. Ooh. <laughs> that does 1d10. Yeah. But every couple of levels you get another ray attack with it. Okay. So it goes from 1d10 to being two attacks at 2d10, uh you know, rolling 2d10 and so on and so forth. They can get up to like four or five of these jeez in the one attack. And the invocations a warlock can take can alter their eldritch blast. And it's a cantrip, which means you, <laughs> you can, can use it, it every as a single time. You can use it as your only method of attack. Yeah, yeah, that's and there's nothing wrong with that. See, okay, now I need to play this character. <laughs> Warlocks are really, yeah, really good actually. Yeah, yeah, because there's a lot of options for war- warlocks. It does remove my problem with the spell slots. <laughs> You just <laughs> you get very see warlocks get very limited spells. They do have spell slots. Mm. They cast them at the highest level they are available to cast spells at. Mm-hmm. Um, no matter what level the spell is, mm-hmm. we're not going to sit here and discuss just class for the show, though. Right? Warlocks are really interesting and really neat to play. Yeah. Um, Nathan, if you ever get a chance, we'll we'll get you in to play a warlock. That would be cool. Um, can I call him? I can has fireball. They don't cast fireballs, so no. Oh. No, you can't. That's going to have to be a wizard, huh? Yeah. Oh. Or a sorcerer. Okay. Or a high-level bard. I, but I, I, I want his first name to be Iken Has. No. And his second name to be Fireball. And no. he goes by Ike. That is acceptable. Ike Fireball. I think that that sounds so badass, though. Ike Fireball. Attorney at law. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I did play for, uh, for the first time. And uh, it was pretty good. I might do it again. Ah, uh, that would be fun. Yeah. Do you think you'll be more serious or you'll just be as goofy? Oh, I suppose it depends what I'm ending up playing. If it's a kind of campaign that needs to be more serious, I'm probably still going to be pretty uh, crazy. But That I will... doesn't surprise but... me. That is just you as a person. I can have layers, though, Alex. I can have You're an layers. ogre. Well, I was no, I wanted to be a unicorn. But the thing is I mean <laughs> but that and the unicorn's not particularly serious either. No, no it's not. <laughs> but he's super fun and and he's a great detective. But anyway, uh I wanted to share that for everybody so, to let you know what it's like the first time somebody plays uh just to give you an idea of what my experience was. But, uh, and for those of you that have skipped right to the end of the episode, hello and welcome. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, just a, a, a couple notes that I wanted to touch on before uh, we <laughs> before we go. Um, if uh, if anyone is following along with attempting to play the two people that are uh, tomorrow, there are two people. There's like two whole people that follow along with attempting to play. 
Uh, C- call them out by name, Nathan. Tell them that you're you're proud of them. Uh, there's uh, Thing One and Thing Two. I don't know you who don't, they are. You don't know who they are. I don't know okay. who they are. I just I know that there's usually like a couple people that. Uh, that I I assume in. one is probably DC. One is probably DC, and and the other might be Chris. It might be Chris. I don't I don't know. But uh, but at any rate, uh, if you are Thanks, following, DC and Chris, yeah. Thanks to anyone who's been uh, watching that. Just in general. Anyway, tomorrow starts the uh, free-to-play marathon that I said that I was going to do. Oh, boy. And, um, out of curiosity, Alex, just to take a guesstimate of how many videos I've already put together for that. Uh, probably like 12. Uh, 14. So you were close. Oh, so close. Uh, that was actually just a random guess. I haven't been paying attention. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so that's going to be the next uh, uh, couple months of videos. Uh, if I don't do something in the middle, <laughs> couple months or a couple days of videos, because <laughs> yeah. you could just do one day. Fourteen. I could, I could probably just do one a day. I, I have videos that I've already started compiling past that. Um, Remember, yeah, YouTube algorithm focuses on retention time, not views. That's true. Now it does. Used to be views. Yes. But now, yes. now well, they, they reconfigured it for retention time. Yeah. So you want people to watch for longer periods of time. That's true. I still try to make them fairly compact. So that it doesn't feel exorbitant, like it's an amount of time that you feel like you can really uh, leave with something. To be fair, I think you should do the whole playthrough that you record, and then do the, your super cut version of it. Yeah, I mean, I could probably do that if I can set it up for my Xbox. A lot of these are on the Xbox, so I don't have a camera set up or anything for those. You don't have a, a capture device? You can record from the Xbox, but uh, I don't know if I can set it up on the Twitch. I probably can set it up from a Twitch, but it wouldn't have a video. That would just be a whole lot to go through. Some some of the games I take a long time with. But see, I don't think you've watched any of them, but uh, they don't necessarily uh, run quite like a regular uh, Let's Play. That's because there's no one playing with you. That's true. So that is absolutely true. I'd be ninja that's if why I it's did an, that. It's why in attempting to play, not a let's play. That's exactly right. That's why it is attempting to play. Uh, but anyway, you'll get to see a whole bunch of free to play games that are gonna look an awful lot like other games you're probably familiar with. As I, I found bet they're out, they're all amazing. Yeah. Um, hey, you know what? You're gonna find that uh, if there is a game that you like. There's probably a free-to-play game that's very similar to it that will still and have... probably has stuff you can buy. Oh, yes. I can attest to that. They have cards and, uh, and upgrades and, and modules and all sorts of things that they would love to sell you on. Uh, so, but, uh, and uh, the one that I haven't done, but it's going to be the one that caps the whole thing off, is I'm going to do Fortnite, uh, and uh, that's going to be... It's just going to be terrible. It's going to be me staring off into the distance, looking at the draw distance of the landscape, and just, like, contemplating life in the middle of a battlefield. <laughs> just see how I feel like you need to actually... I feel like you actually need to record the whole session for Fortnite. Man, I might have to. I'll have to... I might um, have to figure out a you way need to, to get a, You need to get a winner winner chicken dinner. Oh, Okay. I can do that. Yep. I'll get an yep. actual I chicken. I think isn't that is that that or is that PUBG that does winner winner chicken dinner? Oh, it might be it might be PUBG. I'm not sure. I don't remember. One of them when you win, you actually get like a winner winner <laughs> chicken dinner. Oh, that's fun. I'm like seriously, what? Knowing my luck, I'll probably end up in a match with like Ninja and Marshmallow. <laughs> and I'll get killed instantaneously. You're gonna be like, what are these controls? Oh, I'm dead. Doctor Disrespect, no! Right, it's round two, what are these controls? Nope, dead. No! Why? Why? Yeah, that, that would be, totally be the game that I end up with. But, at any rate. Also, uh, one other programming note. Uh, if you've been listening to Orbital, you know, that thing, uh, you might have noticed that my... That ep- thing. Yeah, my, my episodes are a little sporadic, um, and that had something to do with, like, all the videos I was playing to. <laughs> and uh, and the various other projects that I've done. So uh, Orbital, plan on Orbital coming back uh, in September, back to a bi-weekly schedule, but I just have, like, guests and stuff this month, and it's just kind of all over the board, and I'm still doing a bunch of things, so... Uh, but uh, anyway. Nathan's been busy. Nathan's been busy. I knew that I wanted to do the Francis Scott Key one for the 4th of July. Um, there you go. And, and so I, I really, really wanted to do that. Um, but, uh, I, I have others that I know that I want to do, but I just 
haven't quite been in the headspace or with a time frame right now <laughs> where where I uh, was really able to devote time to it. So I'm I'm gonna and try all that, to get that stuff I've been doing on the side. Oh wait, <laughs> oh wait. You have so many things that are going on. I have life things that are going on. I'm sorry. You have life things. This is my life. My life consists of this. Um, and so I guess uh, for, for anyone out there who would be interested in finding all of those things that we do when we are online, Alex, where could they go? Discord. That, yep. You could. Oh, that. you mean not actually like online at the time? Mm. You mean like on the internet? I was thinking. I mean, you can go to Discord, too. We have a link somewhere yep. on the website. Oh, I think there's a link. I believe so. Um, you can find us at delvecast.com. Yep. And uh, then all of the things that we had previously mentioned, those are, are readily available from the site. You can watch it all. It's pretty great. You can even watch the videos on the site. I embedded them in the actual posts. So that's fun. Oh, nice. Yeah, you don't even nice. have to go specifically to our YouTube channel. You can actually watch them right from the post. So. I mean, you can do both. Either way, you can whatever do suits your needs. You can do both. Just don't watch them while driving. No, don't do not do that. And don't play Pokemon Go while driving. That's just a... You can't anyways. Well... Hey, Nathan, we have a Patreon. And, uh, Alex, we actually have uh, three patrons. We have uh, two that are at our shiny level. That's our $5 level. We always like to mention them. Uh, we have Dom Perry uh, from Nine Dragon Games. And uh, we have Bonnie Ainsworth, no relationship to me. Are you sh- are you sure no relationship? Well, uh, not not uh, not that I want to admit on air. <laughs> How about that? Are you ashamed? Thanks, mom. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I hope they're listening to this. Yeah. Oh no, they no, they will. I'm sure they will. Make sure to check us out on iTunes and Google Play. Please rate and review and subscribe when you go. And uh, you should also be aware that we are on something called Twitter, and I am at Satanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. And uh, so for all of your Delvey needs, you can go right over there. That whole thing about role-playing, I think this is going to catch on, Alex. Oh, oh, good. You think it's going to be a thing once in a while? You know, I, I, I think I'm getting in on the ground floor here with this oh, tabletop thing. And uh, I'm feeling there's really something to this. There's a market you here. Got, you got to tell somebody about that. Oh, yeah. I, I got to tell the world. If you're listening to this and you, you weren't already aware, uh, Tabletop might be a, a pretty cool thing. I think it's catching fire. Until next time, though, thank you for joining us here on Delve, which is actually a Tabletop podcast, ironically. Yeah, we do things like that once in a while. Yeah, sometimes we talk about that. Um, and, uh, we'll see you on the next one. Bye. Bye.